so fast, you nincompoops. Where's the car? What are you gaping at? I should like to thank you for all your care and kindness. The whole of my life, I've never been so miserable. But I wish you all good day. I hope forever. Come along, come along. What's uh, keeping us? I didn't know he was being discharged today. Discharged? He's been expelled. There goes the old uh, fox at last. Uh, what a beautiful sight. Goodbye, Sir Goodbye, Alfred. Alfred. Bye. 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 Do you think he'll be back again? He does. I'm leaving. <laughs> Oh, my, what a miserable...
miserable day. Just perfect for your homecoming. You know, I always say it's worth having the rain just to appreciate the sunshine when it comes. Oh, tell me, is there too much draught? Shall I shut the window? No, just shut up, will you? Now you're being naughty again, Sir Wilfred. We must keep our spirits up. London. It's so eccentric. Were you knighted at the palace, Sir Wilfred? No, oh, at the zoo, I think. Look, there's Harrods. I buy all my stockings there. Amazing. married a law student years ago, but he caught pneumonia and went, just like that. Died of fright, didn't he? Remember, you've been flat on your back now for two months. Oh, stand back, stand back. Williams, my cane. such sentimentality and I go straight back to hospital. Not likely. They won't take you back. Then I'll put those in water. Come along, Carter. Look at this room. Old, ugly, musty. I never knew I could miss anything so much. Miss you too, Carter. Must you, old buzzard? Oh, thank you, sir. I'm not a religious person, sir. When they took you away in that ambulance, I lit a candle. Oh, thank you, Carter. Well, actually, I was lighting it for myself, sir. I mean, if anything happened to you, what would happen to me after all these years? No, oh, indeed. I started with your first murder trial, you know. Indeed, you did. 37 years ago. I still got the same wig. Face it, Carter, will you? Yes, sir. I'm, uh, I'm afraid we put it away, sir. Put it away? Ooh, in mothballs. Mothballs. I suppose you thought I wasn't going to practice again. Oh, no, sir. We have several interesting briefs for you. A divorce case, tax appeal, very simple, excellent fees. Never that. I'm sorry, Sir Wilfred, but you're not to undertake any more criminal cases. The doctors. Doctors? They've deprived me of everything. Tobacco, alcohol, female companionship. Carter. Yes, sir. You can bring me a bigger box, bigger mothball. And put me away in it, too. 11.30, Sir Wilfred. 
time for a nap before lunch. Later. Come now, let's get you upstairs. Let's get you undressed and we'll lie down. We. Oui. What a prospect. Upstairs. Come along now. No, no, don't pull me. I, I could strike. Oh, you'd never do that. You might break your cigars. Oh, oh, what cigars? The ones you've been smuggling. How, how did they get there? In hospital, he'd hide the brandy, too. We called him Wilfred the Fox. Hmm. I'm confiscating these. Just, just, just one? No. Upstairs, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there's a puff after meals. Not before, not during, not after. Cigars, Sir Wilfred, are a Don't be surprised, Carter. Some dark night, I shall plunge her thermometer into her heart. Oh, no, sir. You mustn't walk up. We have the lift now. No, that lift hasn't worked for a year. Indeed, sir. That's why we had it repaired for your return. The doctor was adamant about it. He ordered it. Are you sure that it's... Oh, yes, it's quite reliable now. Shall we go? Good morning, Miss O'Brien. Ah, me, you. Sir Wilfred, how very good to see you back on the job again. Nothing scheduled except a few dull civil cases. Well, in that case, I think I might have something interesting for you. I have my client right here with me, and uh, this is Mr. Leonard Vole. And he's in quite a ghastly mess, I'm afraid. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Vole? Well, according to Mr. Mayhew, not very well, sir. Sir Wilfred, it's 11.45. I know what the time is. Sorry. Next year, Mayhew. Nice, nice to have met you, my boy. My pleasure, sir. silly to me now, but Mr. Mayhew thinks that I might be arrested at any moment. For what? Well, for murder. <laughs> this uh, woman, a middle-aged widow, was living with um, a housekeeper in Hampstead. The housekeeper claims that Mr. Vole visited the widow the same evening she was found dead. Struck in the back of the head? I see. He seems such a nice, harmless chap. Simply caught in a web of circumstantial evidence. I wonder, could you perhaps think of a line of defense? I think best for the cigar. Oh, oh, yes. Yes, of course. He's a man of good character, an American with uh, an excellent war record. I know you'll like him. She's confiscated the matches. The light. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll get you one. No, 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 no. You don't know, Miss Plimsoll. This will take all our cunning. Young man, 
a rather important point. If you could just join us for a moment. Of course, sir. Sir? Give me a match. What? Give me a match. I'm sorry, I never carry them. Oh, my God. You said I'd like it. I do have a lighter, however. Charming fellow. Mr. Vole, you may or may not have murdered a middle-aged widow, which you saved the life of an old barrister. Well, it's all so fantastic. I haven't murdered anyone. My God. I hate violence of any kind. I'm only here because Christine, that's my wife, thought I might be implicated in some way. Do I really need two lawyers? Excuse me, just, it seems silly. Mr. Vole, those who commit murder in this country face the hangman. Is that silly? No, sir. I, I, I didn't mean... Hey, Hugh. You explain to him, will you? I am a solicitor, Mr. Vole. Sir Wilfred is a barrister. And only a barrister can plead a case in court. The fact is, I made a statement to the police. They seem quite satisfied. They seem satisfied. He made a statement and thinks that's the end of it. You are a principal suspect. Why? Why, why should I be arrested for something I haven't done? Relax, Mr. Vole. You are now in the hands of the finest barrister in London. Hey, you. I may have taken your cigar, but I'm not taking your case. Hold that, will you? I submit we call her Mr. Rogan Moore. A very able man. Oh, Carter, uh -huh. ask Mr. Brogan Moore to come to me as soon as he leaves the court. Yes, sir. Sir Wilfred, I have never known such insubordination since I was a nurse in the front lines during the war. Oh, thanks very much. Oh. What, what, what sort of work do you do? Well, I've worked at all sorts of jobs. Mechanics, mostly. I like working on cars the best, picking up new gadgets for them. Yeah, I see. But you're not working now. No. How did you get to know Mrs. French? On Oxford Street. One day I, I saw this old lady carrying a lot of... Old lady? Well, she was in her 50s, wasn't she? Well, she's carrying a lot of packages, and then right in the middle of the street, she dropped them. She was trying to pick them up, and I saw this bus coming towards her. I yelled at her, and she managed to get to the curb in time. Well, and then? Oh, I picked up the packages for her. I wiped some of the mud off. I tried to calm her down. I presume she was grateful. Oh, you'd have thought I tried to save her life. And then? Well, then she asked me to come and see her. Well, so you went. Oh, I thought it would be rude to refuse. And she seemed very lonely. Her husband had been in the colonial service and died at the... Age of 45. Mm, poor guy. Heart attack. Please. Not while I'm smoking. Um, so... Well, um... And, and then... You saw her quite, quite frequently. Yeah, we'd, um, sip sherry and, uh, play canasta. You know, it's really weird to... Think of her now, lying there in that living room, murdered. Oh, I assure you, they've moved her by now. Not to have done so would be unfeeling, unlawful, unsanitary. Uh, you, you say that he was in her place on the night of the murder? Oh, yes, but I left before 9.30. The housekeeper claimed that Emily French was still alive when she came back at 10. How much money did you get out of her? Nothing, not a cent. The truth. How much? Why should she give me any money? Because she was in love with you. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. It just... That's ridiculous. She liked me. She, um... Yeah, she even pampered me. Like an aunt. But that's all. I swear it. Why didn't you tell her you were a married man? Oh, I did tell her. Did you take your wife to see her? No. Why not? Well, because, um... Well... She was under the impression that Christine and I didn't get along too well. Did you give her that impression? No, she seemed to want to believe it that way. But you never corrected that impression. I was uh, afraid she'd lose interest in me. Because she was rich? Yes, I suppose so. And you were after her money? 
I... Where are you? Yes, in a way. I, I, I was hoping for a loan, that's all, for an invention of mine. That's all it would have been. Is that so bad? The housekeeper was out. Just you. And that lonely woman in the empty house. How easy it would have been. No. To... When I left her, she was alive. I know things do look bad for me. But I swear to God I didn't do it. You do believe me, don't you? No, well, you're wrong, Mr. Vole. Things don't look bad for you. They look absolutely terrible. You've no alibi, no witness. Just my wife. The testimony of a devoted wife, I'm afraid, does not carry much weight. Ah, Roger Moore. Come in, come in. So good to see you out of hospital. Well, glad to get rid of it. Ah, you know me, Hugh. This is his client. Mr. Leonard Vole. The Emily French murder. Indeed. How do you do? Ah, not too well, I'm afraid. He's no alibi. He's a hot potato. I'm delivering it right in your lap. Much obliged. Mm, well, your best defense will be lack of motive. If he's sponging on her, why kill her off? No motive. No money, I'm afraid. You'll have to sue for your fees. I'll simply put a leon on his 80,000 pounds. What 80,000 pounds? Why, the 80,000 pounds that Mrs. French left you. Left me? They found her will this morning. Congratulations. My God, you've got to be joking. 80? I can't believe it. I've got to call Christine right away. This inheritance, it doesn't make things look any better for me, does it? I wouldn't think so. So now they'll say I did have a motive. I would think 80,000 pounds a very handsome motive. Excuse me, sir. There are two gentlemen here asking for Mr. Vole. The police? Yes, sir. Tell them to come in. Yes, sir. Oh my God. Is this it? I'm afraid it may be, my boy. But I had no idea she'd leave me her money. How could it be a motive? Now, don't worry. Mr. Brogan Moore will bring all that out in court. Ah, Chief Inspector Hurt. Congratulations on your promotion. Oh, I thank you, Sir Wilfred. Sorry to disturb you in your chambers. No, not at all. We have your dangerous Mr. Vole here. You are Leonard Vole? Yes. I have a warrant for your arrest on the charge of murdering one Emily French. I must warn you, anything you say will be taken down and may be used in evidence. Pardon me. I've never been arrested. Do I have to be handcuffed? That won't be necessary. I'll go to the station with you, see you properly charged. Will you explain to my wife? Yes, of course. I can't believe this is happening. Well. Did you give him your monocle test? Yes, I did. And? Curiously enough, he came through with flying colors. Hmm. Uh, excuse me, Sir Wilfred, but Miss Plimsoll has issued an ultimatum. If you're not in bed in one minute, she will resign. Oh. If you refuse to take proper care of yourself, sir, I will be forced to resign, too. Blackmail. All right, Carter. I'll go quiet. <laughs> it's been a bit hectic this morning. Ah, oh, Miss Plimsoll, how alluring you look. Like a caged cobra. How do I manage to resist you? Uh, Wilfred, would you care to question Mr. Vole's wife? Sorry, I'm in no condition to cope with weeping women. You want a dozen handkerchiefs? No. That would not be necessary. How do you do? I am Christine Vall. Madam, 
I'm Wilfred Robart. This is Mr. Brogan Moore. We've some rather bad news for you, I'm afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm quite disciplined. He's been arrested, hasn't he? And charged with murder. I told him he would be. You show extraordinary fortitude. My friend here will take on your husband's defense. Oh. You will not personally defend Leonard. Well, regrettably not. My health, you see. I've heard you described as the champion of the hopeless cause. Perhaps this cause is too hopeless. <laughs> I intend to have a very serious discussion with Dr. Harrison. It was a great mistake to let you come back here. I should have taken you directly to some far-off resort, like Bermuda. Never. You just want to see me in those nasty little shorts. on, if you please. Both tops and bottoms. I'll make your bed. I must say, I feel rather sorry for Mr. Vole. That wife of his sounds absolutely horrid. Oh, foreigner. I think English girls are so much more caring and sensible. My mother... Oh, I come from Dorset. My mother used to say, that no self-respecting Dorset man would ever dream of marrying a foreigner. Have you ever stayed in Dorset? Oh, I do so love it. Such a happy, happy childhood. Oh, yes. oh, well, my career now takes me to so many places, I have no time to be homesick. No. No, that isn't true. Sometimes I feel just... So lonely, you know. So lonely. Oh, but one must keep busy. One must keep active. I think you'll agree with me there. It's so rewarding, you know, to be in the service of those who need professional care. Do you like fish? All of us must do what we do best in this world. And so I remain content. So, Wilfred. To the club, Williams. Yes, sir. Forgive my haste, but my nurse might be following on her broomstick. You must understand, Mrs. Vole, that your husband's entire defence depends on his word and yours. Unfortunately, a jury is often sceptical of a man accused of murder, supported only by the word of his adoring wife. Always. Indeed. He's quite right. Oh, I say, aren't these beauties? Yes, well... well uh... No, no, you go on, my dear fellow. Question this charming lady. I, I won't interrupt you. <clears throat> yes, well, I take it, then, that you knew that your husband had been seeing Mrs. French regularly. I knew it from the day he came home with a pair of green socks she had knitted for him. See? A pair of socks. Well, that's uh, quite natural. Almost endearing. Leonard can be very endearing. He has a way with women. I only hope he will have an all-woman jewellery. He will be acquitted in triumph. You know she'd left him money in her will? A great deal of money. Your husband had no previous knowledge of this. Is that what he told you? Surely not suggesting anything different. I do not suggest anything. Quite obviously, 
Mrs. French looked upon your husband as a son or a nephew. My God, what hypocrites you are in this country. Oh, I'm sorry if I shocked you, Sir Wilfred. No, no, not at all. Please go on. There. Is that more comfortable for you, Sir Wilfred? Hope you don't mind this. Doctor said I should take a stroll twice a day. I don't mind in the least, but I don't see what more I can tell you. Well, let's go back to the night of the murder. Your husband came home before 9.30. Is that correct? Is that what he said? Yes. Then it is correct. He came home before 9.30. If you want the truth, Mrs. Wold, you're going to be under oath. Yes. The truth and nothing but the truth. Mrs. Wold, do you love your husband? Leonard thinks I do. Well, and do you? Am I already under oath? Mrs. Vole, whatever your gambit may be, do you know that under English law, you cannot give testimony against your husband? How very convenient. The prosecution will attempt to hang your husband, a husband who loves you. Loves me? Leonard worships the ground I walk on. I assume that you love him as much? You want to know too much. Our feet are sent, gentlemen. Don't worry. If Leonard needs an alibi, I shall be very convincing. There will be tears in my eyes when I speak. You are a very remarkable woman, Mrs. Wold. And you are satisfied, I hope. I'm damned if I'm satisfied. I want your honest appraisal. Do you think Leonard Vole is innocent? I don't know. I'm sorry, but of course I'll do my very best. Oh. You needn't concern yourself. I shall take it on from here. Sir Wilfred. You may wish to know that I have called Dr. Harrison and given him a complete report on your shocking behavior. Give me a match. Uh, Sir Wilfred. Did you hear what I said? Give me a match. Sir Wilfred, I want you to know how grateful I am, sir, that you are going to represent me. Well, I struck a bargain with my doctors. They let me go on with the case if I go off for six months to Bermuda. Thank you, sir. Let's hope we'll both be the better for it. Would you put these on, please? What for? Because these are the clothes you wore on the night of the murder. We'll circulate a photograph and hope that a witness might have seen you leaving, Mrs. French, to verify the time. By the window, please. We really need this. A uh, hat, please. My wife knows what time I came home. One more in profile, please. I just can't understand why Christine hasn't come to see me. It's been over a week. I'll pick up the negatives later, thank you. Right. Now, wait just a minute. Are you keeping something from me? Is Christine all right? All things considered, Mr. Verbal, I think your wife's taken it very well. It must be damn tough on her. We've never been separated before. Not since we first met. 
Was that in Germany? Right. I was with the Air Force, stationed outside of Hamburg. I met her in a nightclub. She was waiting on tables and hoping to land another job, acting in the theater. You brought her over here? Yes. I uh, rented a flat on Earl's Court Road. And uh, when she saw it for the first time, she was so happy, she just broke down and cried. How it wore me. She lost all her family in the war. I'm all she has. Oh, yes, yes. I understand that. Uh, you don't really know how she feels about me, but you'll find out when she testifies. Mr. Lowe, I'm not putting your wife in the witness box. Why not? She's a follower to the complexity of our language. Prosecution might catch her out. We hear it may be Myers for the prosecution. We can't afford to take any chances. He's good. Formidable. Irritating man, Mr. Myers. I take great pleasure in beating him. Officer. But Christine must give evidence. You must trust me, if only because I'm a mean, ill-tempered old man who hates to lose. Let us wish each other good luck. Sir Wilfred, you don't understand. I can't face this without Christine. I need her. Without her, I'm stuck. You understand? It's really rather touching the way he counts on his wife. Like a drowning man clutching at a razor blade. <laughs> Leonard Vole. Yes. You are charged on indictment that on the 14th day of September 1954, you murdered Emily Jane French. Vole, are you guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. <laughs> Members of the jury, you are sworn to try this case on evidence. You must shut out everything from your minds except what takes place in this court. You may proceed for the prosecution, Mr. Myers. May it please your lordship. I appear in this case with my learned friend, Mr. Barton, and for the defense, Sir Wilfred... Sir Wilfred Robarts and Mr. Brogan Moore. I, I, I trust we are not to be deprived of the learned and stimulating presence of Sir Wilfred this morning. My lord, may I assure my learned friend that Sir Wilfred is in the Old Bailey and will be in his seat shortly. You may proceed, Mr. Myers. Thank you, my lord. <clears throat> the facts in this case are very simple. Medical testimony will prove that Mrs. Emily French was murdered by a blow from a blunt and heavy instrument. It is the case for the prosecution that this blow was struck by the prisoner, Leonard Vole. This is ridiculous. Just a bit of nervous heartburn. I always get it first day of the trial. 2.40 over 1.30. You shouldn't be here at all. I should be in the courtroom. The trial's begun. Syringe, Miss Pimsall. Now be a good, brave boy, Sir Wilfred. It may interest you to know that I am descended from a warrior family which traces its brave past back to Richard the Lionheart. <laughs> You're to have a calcium injection daily. A tranquilizing pill every hour. And in case of a sudden pain or shortness of breath, pop one of those nitroglycerin tablets in the black box under your tongue, and I'll leave you some drops as well. That's enough, Doctor. The judge will be asking for a saliva test. Ah, we'd better get that thermos of cocoa with me. Helps me to wash down the pills. Let me see that, please. My learned patient is not above substituting brandy for the cocoa. Oh, it is cocoa. Hmm. So sorry. 
Yes. Take care of that car, sir. Now, Sir Wilfrid, in the courtroom, you must avoid over-excitement. What's your temper? Keep both your voice and your blood pressure down. Oh, it's all right, thank you, Doctor. I shall be quite safe with the pills and the cocoa. Come on, Carter. We therefore place the time of death at between 10 and 10.30 p.m. That is just before Janet McKenzie called us. Was the severe blow to the back of the neck the cause of death? Yes, sir. Death was instantaneous, caused by one blow from a heavy and blunt instrument. No other signs of a struggle? No, sir. One blow. Would that indicate to you that the murderer had taken her by surprise? My lord, I am taken by the surprise of my learned friend to attempt to solicit from the witness an opinion and not a fact. Quite so. Mr. Myers, it seems that Sir Wilfrid has joined us just in time to catch you on a point of legal procedure. Please rephrase your question. My lord, I withdraw the question. Did you say the room gave the impression that a robbery had taken place? Yes, a window was broken with glass on the floor and fragments were found outside. Uh, the fragments outside, however, were not consistent with the window having been forced from the outside. So what you are saying is that someone had attempted to make it look as if the glass had been forced from the outside. Oh, no, that's the truth. My learned friend is putting words in the witness' mouth. If he answers his own questions, the presence of the witness would be superfluous. <laughs> quite, quite. Don't you think so, Mr. Myers? Yes, indeed, my lord. <clears throat> Was any of the lady's property missing? Nothing, according to the housekeeper. Is it not your experience, sir, that burglars usually burgle when they break into a house? Yes, sir. Do you produce a jacket, Inspector? Yes, sir. And, and is, is that the jacket? It is, sir. I propose that that be tagged to Exhibit 1. Where did you find it, Inspector? It was found in the prisoner's flat. I handed it to our lab to uh, test for bloodstains. And did you find bloodstains? Oh, yes, sir. But though an attempt had been made to wash them out. What tests did the laboratory make? First, to determine that stains were human blood, and then to uh, classify the group or type. And were the stains of a particular type? Oh, yes, sir. They were type O. Did you test the blood of the dead woman? We did, sir. That was also type O. Thank you very much, Inspector. Inspector, is it not possible that a burglar might enter an empty house and then suddenly encounter Mrs. French and strike her, and then, discovering that she is dead, panic, flee without taking anything? Yes, sir, it's certainly possible. My lord, I must admit that it is entirely impossible to guess what goes on in the mind of an entirely imaginary burglar. You're quite right, Mr. Myers. Please let us confine ourselves to the facts, Sir Wilfrid. When you questioned the prisoner as to the stains on his jacket, did he not show you a recently healed scar on his wrist and tell you that he'd cut himself while slicing bread with a kitchen knife? Yes, sir, that is what he said. Did his wife not tell you the same? Yes, sir. But afterwards, no, she just, told us... Just yes or no, if you please. Did his wife tell you he'd cut himself while slicing bread? Yes, sir. I'll ask you to examine this knife. Will you please test the edge with your finger? Oh, no, carefully now, carefully. Do you agree that that knife is razor sharp. Yes, sir. Such a knife could inflict a cut which would bleed profusely. It might, sir. Now then, you stated the blood on the prisoner's jacket and the blood of Mrs. French are the same type. Oh. Correct. And if the prisoner's blood should be of the same type, oh, then the stains on his jacket might very well have resulted from the knife. Did you analyze the prisoner's blood? No, sir. I have a certificate. North London Hospital. Then Abdul is certified to be type O.
Call Jenna McKenzie. Silence! Take this in your right hand and read aloud what's on this card. Carter! I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give to this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, madam. Is your name Janet Mackenzie? Yes. Were your companion housekeeper to the late Mrs. Emily French? I don't think he could get through the trial without his medicine every hour. I was her housekeeper. I have no opinion of so-called companions, poor feckless bodies, afraid to do a bit of honest work. But you did know her very well. Ten years. She trusted me. And many's the time I've prevented her from doing a foolish thing. Will you tell us, in your own words, what happened on the evening of September the 14th? It was a Friday, in my night out. And I went off to see my niece, a five-minute walk. I'd promised to take her a pattern, a paper pattern. And I'd been there for a while when I remembered I forgot it. So I walked back to the house in the rain the phonograph was playing in the sitting room. Mrs. French was laughing. She was in there with him. No, that isn't true! I heard them. Are you quite certain you heard Mr. Vole? Aye. He visited her often enough. So I went up to my room and I fetched the pattern. And then I heard this noise, crashing glass and a thump, and then another thump. And, and, and what did you do? I was frightened. So I ran down to the sitting room, and there she was, dead. And everything tossed hither and yon. Did you really think a burglary had taken place? Oh, my lord, I must protest. Quite right. I will not allow that question to be answered, Mr. Myers. How much did you know about the prisoner? I knew he needed money. Not that he'd ever asked her for it. He was too clever for that. Were you aware that he was a married man? No, no, indeed, we were not. Janet! My lord, I must protest. What Mrs. French knew or did not know must be pure conjecture on the part of the witness. I will put it this way. <clears throat> you formed the impression he was a single man. Why? Well, the books she ordered about women who'd married men years younger than themselves, about Disraeli and, and his wife. I knew what she was thinking. I'm afraid we can't admit that. Why? Members of the jury, it is quite possible for a woman to read Disraeli without contemplating marriage to a younger man. <laughs> Concerning her will. Uh, she had it revoked, uh, the old one. And uh, a new one drawn up. I heard her telephoning her solicitor, and so did he. He was right there. You actually heard Mrs. French discussing her new will with him? Yes. He was to have all of her money. No one else meant to her what he did. When did this take place? September the 8th. It was a week to the day before she was murdered. Thank you. That concludes my examination. Not just yet, Miss Mackenzie. You've given us testimony about two wills. In the old one, who was to receive the bulk of Mrs. French's estate? I was. And in the new one, only a small annuity for you and the rest to the prisoner Leonard Bowles. A wicked injustice if he... Ever touches a penny of that money? I can quite understand if you feel antagonistic to the prisoner. Me? A antagonistic? He's a shiftless, scheming rascal, but I am not antagonistic to him. His friendship with your mistress cost you 
the bulk of her estate. I never liked him. Your candor is most refreshing. <laughs> you say you heard them on the night of September the 14th. What did you hear them say? They were laughing. What did the prisoner say? Just laughing. Quite sure about that, are you? Aye. The door was closed. Open. It was open a wee crack. To pass the door quickly. Well, long enough to, to hear. Well, come, come, Miss Mackenzie. I'm sure you don't want to suggest to the jury that you were an eavesdropper. It was him. I know it. But did you see him? Did you actually see him? Uh, her. What? I could see her, but I knew he was there. Why? Because you heard him? Yes. Under the National Health Insurance, Miss Mackenzie, did you apply for hearing aid? In what? For hearing aid. Uh, what did you say? Well, Lord, I must object to the way this question has been put. I'll repeat the question, my Lord. I asked you in a normal tone of voice, audible to the open court. Did you apply to the National Insurance for a hearing aid? Yes, I did. Did you get it? Uh, not yet. And yet you state that you could hear the prisoner's voice in a room beyond. What? No more questions, my lord. Perhaps you could help me, Your Lordship. I applied for the hearing aid over six months ago, and... My dear Miss Mackenzie, considering the rubbish being talked about these days, you have not missed anything. <laughs> Over we go. And now, if it please your lordship, I should like to call upon our final witness for the prosecution, called Christine Helm. Christine. Call Christine Helm. Call Christine Helm. This way, madam. Please remove your glove, madam. Take this in your right hand and read aloud what's written on this card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence which I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, madam. My lord, I should have thought it only too obvious to point out to this court that the witness summoned here by the prosecution is the wife of the prisoner, Leonard Vole, and therefore... My lord, I must call my learned friend's attention to the fact that uh, I summoned uh, Christine uh, Helm, not uh, Christine Vole. Your name is, in fact, Christine Helm. Yes, Christine Helm. And you've been living as the wife of the prisoner, Leonard Vole. Yes. Are you actually his wife? No. We went through a form of marriage in Hamburg, but I already had a husband living somewhere in East Germany. He is still living today. But you never told Mr. Vole. It would have been stupid to tell him. He would not have married me, and I would have been left to starve over there in the rubble. Thank you. My lord, there is proof of a marriage between the witness and Leonard Vole, there is no proof whatsoever of an alleged previous marriage. My lad, uh, the alleged previous marriage is extremely well documented. I have a certificate. Mrs. Helm, uh, is this the certificate of your marriage to one Otto Ludwig Helm? The ceremony having taken place in Breslau on April the 18th, 1942? Yes. 
This is the paper of my marriage. I would like to see that certificate. Having had the benefit of Sir Wilfrid's opinion, you may proceed, Mr. Myers. Thank you, my lord. Mrs. Helm, are you willing to give testimony against the man you have been calling your husband? I am willing. In uh, the night in question, you stated to the police that uh, your husband returned home before 9.30. Did he, in fact, return home before 9.30? No. He returned at 10 minutes past 10. Christine, what are you saying? That's not true. You know it's not true. Hi there. As your counsel will tell you, Verl, you will very shortly have an opportunity of speaking in your own defense. Now then. Mr. Vole returned at 10 minutes past 10. What happened next? He was breathing hard, very excited. He took off his coat and looked at his sleeves. They had blood on them. Gone. I said, what has happened? And what did the prisoner say to that? He said, I have killed her. Christine, why are you saying these things? Why are you lying? Silence. She's awful, that one. I've known it all along. Sir Wilfred, would you like me to adjourn for a few minutes? Your Lordship is most gracious. But pray, let the witness continue. We're all of us so caught up in the suspense of this horror fiction. Perhaps he has it in store. It's my proof. I'm enduring. Proceed, Mr. Myers. Thank you, Lord. Mrs. Helmer, it's true that you told the police, that the prisoner returned home before 9.30? Yes, because Leonard wanted me to say that. But you've changed your story since then. Why? I cannot go on lying to save him. He married me. And I was grateful to him for getting me out of Germany. Always. What he has asked me to do, I have done. Because I was grateful to him but not because you loved him? No. I never loved him. So it was out of gratitude to the prisoner that you gave him an alibi in your statement to the police? Yes. Now you feel you were wrong to do so? It is murder. That woman was a harmless old fool, but I cannot be an accomplice to murder for him. I cannot do it. I will not do it. So this is the truth. He returned home after 10 with blood on his sleeves, saying, I killed her. That is the truth. That is the truth before God. That is the truth before God. Thank you. Mrs. Vole, or Mrs. Helm, which do you prefer to be called? It does not matter. Oh, does it not? In this country, we're inclined to take a rather more serious view of marriage. However, Frau Helm, it would appear that when you first met the prisoner, you lied to him about your marital status. I was desperate to get out of Germany. You lied, did you not? Just yes or no, please? Yes. Thank you. And then, subsequently, when you were arranging the marriage, you lied to the authorities? I did not tell them the truth, because... You lied to them? Yes. And in the ceremony of marriage itself, when you swore to love and to honor and to cherish your husband, that, too, was a lie. Yes. And then, when the police questioned you about this wretched man who believed himself married and loved, you told them... I told them what Leonard wanted me to say. You told him that he was at home with you by 9.30. And now you say that was a lie. Yes, a lie. And when you said he had accidentally cut his wrist again, you lied. Yes. And now, today, you've told us a new story entirely. The question is, Frau Helm, were you lying then, or are you lying now, or are you not, in fact, a chronic and habitual liar?
My lord, is my learned friend to be allowed to bully and insult this witness in this manner? Mr. Myers, this is a capital charge. And within the bounds of reason, I would like the defense to have every latitude. Indeed. The witness has violated so many oaths that I'm surprised the testament did not leap from her hand when she was sworn in here today. I doubt there's anything to be gained by questioning you any further. That will be all, Frau Helm. Mrs. Helm, do you know the meaning of the English word perjury? Yes. It means to swear false under oath. And are you aware that in this country the penalty for perjury is a very heavy term of imprisonment? Yes, I am aware. Mindful of this, do you say that the evidence you have given is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God. Thank you. That concludes the case for the prosecution, my lord. <laughs> Sir Wilfred, are you ready for the defence? My lord, members of the jury, the prosecution very ably presented against the prisoner Leonard Vole a case of the most overwhelming circumstantial evidence. You've heard the evidence of Janet McKenzie, a worthy and devoted housekeeper who suffered two most grievous losses. First, the death of her beloved mistress. And second, being deprived of an inheritance of 80,000 pounds, which she had fully expected to receive. May I express my sympathy to her on both these mishaps. And finally, most damaging of all, the prosecution has produced a surprise witness, one Christine Helm, whom the prisoner married and removed from the rubble of her homeland to the safety of this country, giving her his love and the protection of his name. Though a wife cannot give evidence against or harmful to her husband, her marriage to him has proven fraudulent and bigamous. I would ask you to consider this marriage for what it is worth. This, then, is the prosecution's case. It is now the term for the defense. We could present a variety of witnesses to his character, his war record, the lack of any criminal association in the past. However, I will call upon the only one witness who can shed light upon this tragic riddle, the prisoner himself. I call upon Leonard Stephen Bow. Take this in your right hand and read aloud what's written on this card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. My name is Leonard Vole. It is. Did you or did you not, on the night of September the 14th last, murder Emily French? I did not. Silence! Have you, in fact, concluded your examination of the witness, Sir Wilfred? My lord, the prisoner has now endured three days of the most profound mental agony and shock. The defense feels his faculties should be spared for the cross-examination. Silence! Mr. Bowen. When you first made the acquaintance of Mrs. French, were you employed? No. 
You had money then in savings? Nothing. Did you receive any money from Mrs. French? No, not a penny. Did you expect to receive any? No, sir. Did you know that she had left you money in her will? No, sir. When you went to visit Mrs. French for the last time, did you wear a trench coat and a hat? Yes, I did. Was it this coat and hat? Yes. My lord, uh, the defense circulated this poster in the hope that a witness would come forth who had seen the accused leave Mrs. French's house at the time stated. Unfortunately, the effort was without result. However, the defense will be pleased to hear that a witness has now come forward who saw the prisoner wearing this hat and this coat. Lamentably, it was not on the night of the murder, but exactly one week before. Were you or were you not in a travel agency in Regent Street on the 8th of September, inquiring about schedules and prices of foreign cruises? What if I were? That isn't a crime, is it? Oh, no, no, certainly not. Many people go on a cruise if they can pay for it. But you couldn't pay for it, could you, Mr. Vole? No. And yet you came into this travel agency, uh, oh, with a lady, a blonde, a honey blonde, I understand. <laughs> Tell me, please, how on earth did you expect to pay for such an expensive and luxurious cruise. I don't know. It was, uh... You don't know, perhaps I can tell you. On that very day, you heard Mrs. French alter her will, leaving you the bulk of her money. I didn't. I knew nothing about the will. And in the afternoon, you set about making plans to dispose of the money. No. It was nothing like that. I, uh... Well, I met this girl at a pub. I can't even remember her name. And uh, we had a couple of drinks. We left together. We went past this display window, and there were posters of blue seas and palm trees, and we went in. A uh, man gave me sort of a funny look because I was dressed a little shabby, and uh, it irritated me, so I kept asking for the swankiest tours, you know, all deluxe and cabin on the boat deck, just putting on an act. An act. Mm -hmm. <laughs> an act when you knew you were going to inherit 80,000 pounds. No, it was nothing like that. I didn't think of killing anybody or inheriting any money. Just a coincidence that Mrs. French was killed only one week later. I did not kill her. Then why did Christine Helm testify as she did in this court? I don't know why. I don't even know why I still call her my wife. She must be losing her mind. She seemed remarkably sane and self-possessed to me. So insanity, then, is the only reason you can think of. I don't understand it. God. What's happened? What's changed her? I can't tell you. Unless, of course, she's speaking truth. She says you came home with blood on your clothes. I cut my wrist! You cut your wrist deliberately. No! You came home at ten minutes after ten. That's not true! You've got to believe me. You've got to believe me. You've got to believe me. And you murdered Emily French. I didn't! I swear to God, I didn't. I've never hurt anyone, ever. Oh, God. It's a nightmare. It's some ghastly, horrible nightmare.
Wilfred, how did it go today? Oh, Sir Wilfred, I'm from Hawksome Hill. I've brought your Bermuda shorts along for a fitting. I, I what? I think you'd better slip into them now, Sir Wilfred. Otherwise, we'll never have them ready for tomorrow. Tomorrow, my dear mayor, I'm in the middle of a murder trial. But it'll be all over by tomorrow afternoon, and the boat train doesn't leave until 9.40. Right. You work it out. You know my shape. You've stabbed it often enough. But, Sir Wilfred, you must go upstairs and have a nice lukewarm bath and your calcium injection. And there's still a great deal of packing to be done. Ridiculous talk about boat trains. How do we know? The journey may be out for days. Not in this case, I'm afraid. It seems far too open and shut. Uh, I watched them when Frau Helm was on stand. They didn't like her. True, they didn't like her, but they believed her. They liked Leonard Vole, but they didn't believe him. I must say that travel agency business with Blonde didn't help matters. Uh, cigar, Wilfred? Wilfred, do you think she lied? Do you? I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, uh, I am. She lied. The only question in my mind is why? What's her game? What's she up to? Why? So, Wilfred, I hope that in your final speech tomorrow you won't let yourself get too emotionally involved. You must think of your physical condition. He's right. I want to see you save yourself. This isn't going to be your last case. Yes, it is. But till it's over, I'm still a barrister. And my client's life's at stake. That's all that matters, his life. He's a right to expect the best that I can give. If I can't stand up to make my last plea for him, I'll make it sitting down. And if I feel out of breath, I'll take a pill. I'll take two pills. I take the lot and the box as well. Yes. You have. Well, who is this? None of your business. I've got some in here to sell him. No, I'm sorry, but the Leonard Vaux case. Leonard Vaux. I've got the goods on his wife. Uh, yeah. Uh, just a moment. There's a woman who says that she has the goods on Mr. Vole's wife. Wilfred Robarts here? Meet me on Tilby Street, by the docks, number 27. Second floor, I'll wait an hour. Bring plenty of money and come alone. Uh, who is this? <laughs> Drunken witch. Every murder trial, we always get some of them. Always with some ultimatum. Meet me at Tilby Street. And where the dogs <laughs> bring plenty of money. Balderdash! Balderdash! Oh. Some wild goose chase in my condition, just for course some drunken hell is. So, Wilfred, you, you're coming with me, Mayhew. Good heavens, Sir Wilfred, where are we? It looks positively sinister. Steady, Mayhew. Ah, here we are, Williams. Slow down. I don't like this. I don't like this at all. Mayhew? No. I can't 
that you go up there alone. It's far too dangerous. I'm coming with you. She wants to see me alone. And she shall. Very well. But if you're not back in ten minutes, I'm coming after you. Second floor, I believe. Careful, old friend. Stay calm. Mind you, don't trip, Sir Wilfred. Gentleman friend, care for a drink. No, thank you. What have you got for me? Letters. That's what I've got. Letters. That wife of his wrote. You mean letters written by Christine Vole to her husband? Her husband. Ha! Don't make me laugh. Poor ruddy chum. He's been talking good and proper, he has. And these letters prove. I see them. You can see one, and then I what's me money. A hundred pounds. A hundred pounds? Take it or leave it. All right. Little beauties. You see. Authentic. There is all right. Where did you get these? What difference does it make as long as she gets what's coming to her? What have you got against her? Say as much. Chap I was going with. Got to seeing her on the sly. And I caught them together. Told her what I thought of her, didn't I? And he give me this. I've waited years to pay her back. And now it's come. I'm deeply sorry, madam. What up, Leonard Vole? You may sit down. <clears throat> Since the defense has called but one witness, it has the right to be heard last. Therefore, Mr. Myers, if you are ready, let us have the final speech for the prosecution. Lord. Members of the jury, I believe the only conclusion to be drawn in this case is a verdict of guilty 
against the prisoner. I, I will now, in the course of... I think you had better begin again, Mr. Myers. That is, if Sir Wilfred is at all interested in our proceeding. Oh, I am, indeed. And I now ask that the case for the defence to be real. I'd like a witness to be recalled. My lord, I, I must uh, strenuously protest. Evidence of the most startling nature has come into my possession only last night. Of course, my learned friend proposes to take is, is quite unprecedented. I anticipated my friend's objection. And I'm prepared to meet it with ample precedent. Case of the Crown against Stillman, on page 463, 1926. Appeal case. Also, the Crown against Porter, August 11, 1930. Winchester, besides, is on page 231. And further, the case of Sullivan. I'm sure your lordship will remember it, since you appeared for the prosecution. I did. Yes. Oh. Yes, I'd recall now. What is this new evidence you have, Sir Wilfrid? Letters, my lord. Letters from Christine Hell. My lord, the prosecution continues its objection. If my memory serves me right, in the case of your own objection in the Crown versus Sullivan, your objection was upheld. Your memory, for once, serves you ill, Mr. Myers. My objection was overruled at the time by Mr. Justice Swindon, as yours is now by me. Call Christine Hell. Call Christine Hell. Call Christine Hell. You've still got your doubts about bowl. I don't mind betting you a very small box of cigars. This is hell. You appreciate that you're still on oath? Yes. Do you know a man named Max? I don't know what you mean. It's a simple question. Do you know a man named Max? Certainly not. Oh, well, that's a fairly common name. Yet you mean you've never known a man by the name of Max? Perhaps in Germany, but that was a long time ago. I shan't ask you to go back as far as that. Just a few weeks. To September the 20th last. What have you got there? A letter. I suggest that on the 20th of September, you wrote a certain letter. I don't know what you're talking about. Addressed to a man named Max. I did nothing of the sort. A letter was but one of a series written to the same man. These are lies, all lies. You would seem to have been on, let us say, on intimate terms with this man. Sir Wilfred, that isn't true. The prisoner in his own interest will remain silent. I'm concerned only with one particular letter. My beloved Max, an extraordinary thing has happened. I believe all our difficulties may be ended. This is a forgery. It isn't mine. It isn't even my letter paper. It is. No. I write my letters on small blue paper with my initials on it. Like this. This. Happens to be a note from my tailor for a pair of extremely becoming Bermuda shorts. <laughs> <laughs> Wilfred the Fox. That's what we call him, and that's what he is. Now, Mrs. Helm, you've been kind enough to identify your letter paper. Would you care to have an expert identify your handwriting? Damn you! Damn you! Leave her alone! Damn you! Mrs. Help. Let me get out of here. Let me go! Mrs. Help! Usher, give the witness a chair.
Sir Wilfrid, will you now read the letter so the jury can hear it? My beloved Max, an extraordinary thing has happened. All our difficulties may soon be solved. Leonard is suspected of murdering the old lady I told you about. His only hope of an alibi depends on me. Suppose I testify that he was not at home with me at the time of the murder, that he came home with blood on his sleeves, that he admitted to me that he killed her. Leonard says he would never let me leave him, but if this succeeds, he will be leaving me. They will take him away forever, and I will be yours. I count the hours, my beloved, until we are together. Christine. Silence! Will you go back to the witness box, Mrs. Hell? I now ask you again, Christine Held, did you write this letter? Before answering, Mrs. Helm, I wish to warn you. If you have already committed perjury in this courtroom, I must advise you not to add to your crime. wrote the letter. I keep asking myself, Sir Wilfrid, which is the harder, your head or your arteries? Well, all I can say is you, you better stop chancing your luck. Well, we're all packed, Doctor. The luggage is in the car. Oh, I hope the jury doesn't take all afternoon. I concede. Congratulations. Not yet. Oh, come now, it's all over. Wrapped up neat and tidy. What's wrong? Everything. It's all just a little too neat. Too tidy. Now that's precisely what's wrong with it. You're not worried about the verdict, are you? It's not their judgment that worries me. It's mine. Put up, Vole. Members of the jury, are you all agreed upon your verdict? We are. Do you find the prisoner at the bar, Leonard Vole, guilty or not guilty? Not guilty, my lord. Oh, no. You are found not guilty of the charge and are hereby discharged and free to leave the court. Be upstanding. All persons who have anything to do before my lords, the Queen's justices of the Central Criminal Court may depart hence. God save the Queen.
Thank you, sir, for everything. You were wonderful. Let's say we were lucky all around. The warder has your belongings, sir. They'll take you to sign the papers, and they release you. Right. I'll go with you. I brought your hat and coat. Let's go quickly, before they change their mind. He's quite chipper, isn't he? Only an hour ago, he had one foot on the gallows and another on the banana skin. You ought to be pleased, Wilfred. Aren't you? Not yet. He was disposed of the gallows, but there's still that banana skin somewhere under somebody's foot. Wait in here, madam, till we get rid of the crowd. Come on, break it up. Are you ready, sir? Because Miss Plimsoll will be waiting. Let me finish the last of the cocoa, Carter. But I'm still beyond her jurisdiction. You British can get so emotional. I apologize for my compatriots. Ah, oh, that's all right. I don't mind being pushed around or called names, but I do have a all run now in my nylons. In case you're not familiar with our prison regulations, no silk stockings allowed. Prison? Well, I go to prison. Indeed, you'll certainly be charged with perjury, tried for it. And to prison you shall go. Well, it won't be for life, will it? If I were the judge, it would be. You loathe me, don't you? What a wicked woman I am. And how brilliantly you exposed me. The great Sir Wilfred Robarts did it again. Well, let me tell you something. You didn't do it alone. You had help. What are you driving at? Leonard is free. And we did it. We? We. You remember the first time I came to see you. And you told me that no jury would believe an alibi given by a loving wife, no matter how much she swore that her husband was innocent. That gave me the idea. What idea? The idea that I should be a witness. But not for my husband, no. For the prosecution. That I should swear that Leonard was guilty and that you should expose me as a vicious liar because only then would the jury believe that my husband was innocent. So, now you know the whole story, Sir Wilfred. I'll give you something to dream about, mister. Wanna kiss me, daddy? I suspect you something. I was never that. Thank you for the compliment. It is a long time since I was an actress. But I have never played such an important part. And all those blue letters? It took me hours to write them, to invent Max. There never was a Max. There never has been anyone but Leonard. Only Leonard. Oh, my dear. Why couldn't you have trusted me, worked with me truthfully, honorably? We would have got him off. I could not take that risk. You see, you thought he was innocent. And you knew he was innocent. I understand. No, Sir Wilfred, you do not understand. I knew he was guilty. Good God. That can't be true. I wish to God it was. But Leonard did come home a few minutes past ten. He did have blood on his sleeves. And he did tell me that he had killed that woman. He pleaded with me. I knew only I could save him. You, know, you did save him. 
A murderer. Again, Sir Wilfred, you do not understand. I love you. I told you she was an actress. And a good one. I knew she'd do something for me, but I just didn't know what or how. Leonard, darling. Fooled you completely, didn't she? No. It was you, Vole, who really fooled me. After 37 years, you'll be so blind. Easy. We both got out of it alive. Better take a pill. There's still courts in England. They're not through with you yet. Well, sure they are. You know that. You did too good a job, Sir Wilfred. You got me off. I can't be tried again. That's the law. Somehow, in some way, you'll pay for this. I agree. Let's double your fee to begin with. And how about a new hearing aid for Janet McKenzie? And for you, my dear, 5,000 pounds to pay for your perjury trial. That ought to get you off easy. Oh, thank God it's <laughs> over. I could never go through that again. But now, yeah. I've got you back. Uh, Christine, Christine, I think that there's something really that we have to face, and the sooner the better. What? Well, what, what are you talking about? Yes. You and I, uh, we've been pretending here all along. In the trial, I mean. For everyone. We don't want to pretend anymore. Not to each other. We've changed. We don't want to go back to the way things were. But, Leonard, I... Believe me, I have absolutely no regrets, but it's over. No. We've only 20 minutes to catch the boat train, no. so we'll... Oh, my God. You can't mean that. You can't leave me. No. I saved your life getting you out of Germany. You saved my life here in this courtroom. Now we're even, right? Leonard, darling, how much longer are we going to have to stay here? I'm rather anxious to get out of this place. We'll be leaving in a minute. Oh! That's one of the few true statements that was made. You see, we did meet at the travel agency. Oh, dear God, please listen to me. I love no, no, you. Christine, let's not make it any worse. Or they might try you as an accessory. No. And you know what that means. Let them. I don't care what they do. Or if they must try me, let it be for murder. <laughs> and you can dismiss the car. We won't be leaving now, will we? No. Thank you, Miss Plimsoll. Get Brogan Moore to my chambers directly. And have May you there too. We're appearing for the defense in the trial of Christine Wolf. Come on, old man. Sir Wilfred! You 
forgot your brandy.